thank you for letting me know I wasn't recording it. That would be very sad. All right, so we're going to build trains. So I'm going to get rid of these because we don't need them. Um, but when we start building trains, kids will come up with something like this. And then we want the kids reading their trains. So Claire, can you read this train for me? Okay, it's a green plus a red plus a pink plus a yellow plus four whites plus two reds plus a pink and a dark green. Okay, wait. Like you're four. Read it like you're four years old. Yeah. Okay. Green and red and pink and yellow and white and white and white and white and red and red and pink and dark green. So eventually what's going to happen is the child when they say, especially if you have more than four, four whites, let's say we have six whites or six pinks or whatever we have there, they're going to eventually say to you, four whites, like Claire did. She'll say four whites plus two reds. Probably, if you have a five-year-old or a six-year-old, fairly quickly after you introduce trains, and they're going to realize that, that saying white plus white plus white plus white is an extremely cumbersome way to describe a train. And so they will just come up and say there's four whites. Well, at that point, we can leave it and just let that go um, and, and allow them to use that. And then at some point you'll want to say, well, that's multiplication. You can call it that in the beginning. You don't have to. Um, and then at some point when you've introduced the um, writing, then we will, we will then explain to them the different ways that we will write. Where is my annotate? And we will, we will show them the different ways that we can write multiplication. So that will come up in chapter three of book one. So we would say um, a green, and by now they should be introduced to these particular symbols. So green plus red plus a pink or purple, whichever one you're using, plus yellow, plus, and we did this, oh, that's a four, not a three. We did this, four W plus two reds plus a pink plus a dark green. But you can also at the same time, and it would be wise to do that you would also call this four of the whites, and we would read this multiplication sign here as of, and plus two of the reds, plus pink, plus dark green. Is they a little bit older, they're gonna come over, I mean, we also have this way of writing it. We also have four times W. All those are ways to do it, and whichever way your kids want to write them, or which, however way you use it in your family, or you want to agree to write it in your classroom is a perfectly acceptable way to do it, as long as everybody understands what it means, and that we all follow the same rules, because the point of math and writing the symbols is that it is for ease of communication. So if we have some kids using it one way and the other kids don't understand what it means and it's gonna cause a problem, or if you have mom knows and mom and dad are disagreeing on how we should write it or siblings are, we just wanna agree that whatever the rules are or however we agree to write it, that everybody's doing the same thing and we all know what it means by the things that we write down and we say. Does that make sense? So we were, we introduced multiplication or this came at, for us within the first week of introducing written symbols. So hopeful and victory, you guys did this in your classes. So how long did it take you guys before somebody came up and said, Hey, can I do this? 
um, probably about, I don't know, three or four months. Wow, you guys took long. Yeah, in our house, I, we must be really lazy at our house. <laughs> Well, it might have been um, before that, but that's when I first connected it because I didn't even know where I was going. Oh, okay. So that makes sense. Yeah, because if you have a long string, because it, it causes a problem that, that if you have a long string of whites, how do you know, like, if you've said white plus white plus, you have to count them all, and then you have to keep track in your head how many of them you've said, um, versus how many are there. This is a problem to just say white plus white plus white plus that that's a problem. You need to just count them, say how many and write it down. All right. We did have a couple that did that reasonably early on, but only ever when they had lots of whites to say. Okay. Yeah, for, it was it was clear. How long did it take you guys before you started using multiplication when you're doing this? Um, I don't know. Gwen still quite often reads them all out, but we don't probably do really long lines like that. They haven't come up a lot in our okay. play. Okay. And I don't use them with the older two. I only use it with my six year old. Okay. All right. Yeah, for us it was fairly quickly. Really, really quickly. Because we did long lines like this, and that was annoying. So, and children <laughs> want to do things, and the brain, the brain naturally wants to work faster. And so, you will find that that's kind of how, when the kids discover the need, that that's when we when we introduce something, is when somebody discovers a need for it. Because um, until then, then it's just something that they aren't even thinking about, and you're introducing into their into their system, and so. So then they're prone to forget it later on if you teach this to them versus I have a need for it and and then we have a reason to be using it. And then they're not going to forget what it is that they're doing. Um, mm. So I wanna talk about, so we can do trains like this and it sh shows up here, but then there's the where we're going to start working on officially trains of a single color. So I want to go there because there's a lot of work in trains of a single color. So we have, we're going to, let's not build oranges because I don't have enough room. So let's do, this train here. Now we can read it and let's talk about the number of ways that we could write this train using multiplication and addition only. So we have, obviously, I will do the most obvious one. I can write this as pink plus pink plus pink plus pink plus pink. See, I'm starting to get really irritated writing it. Five, how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Pink plus pink. So now we're gonna work on our um, associative property and how else can we, using the associative property, we're not gonna say the word associative property with the kids, so something you just need to keep in the back of your mind. How else can we write this? So let's just think about, let's just play a game and figure out how many ways we can, like how many can we come up with in this group? So just any way that we could say it? Yes. Yeah, so we could say seven pink. Ah, seven pink. So this is seven pink. All right, let's do another one. One pink plus six. Okay, so I could go a pink plus six pink. All right. 
And two pink plus five pink. Oh. Two pink plus five pink. And that equals what else? I see a pattern. Three pink plus four pink. Uh, three pink plus four pink. Should I just follow the pattern and go? Yeah. <laughs> four pink plus three pink. Five pink plus two pink and six pink plus a pink. Is there any more? In that section, or in in general? In general, are there any more? Two pink plus two pink plus two pink plus pink. Okay, two pink plus two pink. So the question is, after we're done, how? Will we know when we have them all? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out you. Wise. Uh, there's 64? Is that what you said? Yep. Okay. But how will you know? How will you know when you have? So that would be the question that you have as a family or as a classroom. Probably not in kindergarten, maybe in first grade if you have really bright kids, probably second grade you can start looking at organizing as a way of organizing, their, helping them to organize their thinking is to come up with a way for them to know that they have all, so they have to come up with a way of organizing uh, the patterns to know that they have all the possible patterns for this particular s string. So this is just a big substitution game. If you've not seen my videos on the substitution game or didn't play it, but this is basically all this is, is a great big giant substitution game. We do this as a form of, we call this math narration or math compositions. So we would have seven pink at the top and then we would have just as many, and it doesn't matter if it's two or three or the kid can fill the whole page. Boys will fill up fewer spots and girls will fill up a lot more in the very beginning, but we want to have them just come up with as many ways, like some as a, as a group, but then also do this as an individual project where they come up with as many ways to write this as they, pop, as they can. So we are going to start then after we do things like this and we do this, um, we're going to compare our trains of a single color to other rods and then so we will compare them to rods of a single color, or one rod, and then we'll do more than one rod, particularly of a single color. So um, I'm going to tidy my set up here, tidy and erase all this. And then I think we'll do blue because it's easy. So now we have this structure, and this is, well, and we have blue is the same as, and I just want to go over this, that the equal sign here does not mean, it does not mean write the answer here, it does not mean magically becomes, it does not mean turns into, and it does not mean makes. The equal sign means is the same as. They look differently, but it's the same thing. And I don't care how many times. This is something that teachers do not get. And it's, this is just, I have another class this year of fourth graders, fourth through sixth graders. And if you ask them what the equal sign means, it, they all think that this is a signal to write the answer down. So we want to be clear that the blue is the same as three of the greens. 
These two mean the same thing. So if blue is the same as two greens, let's write some other equivalent expressions that we could, that we can find have to do with blue is the same as three greens. We'll play the substitution game again. So I will do blue is the same as one green. So we'll do a green plus two greens. Anyone else? So are we just working with what's on the screen? Mm -hmm. So then we can say blue equals green plus green plus green. Mm -hmm. Green plus green plus green. And, and a limit. Go ahead, what? Blue equals two green plus one green. Yep, so two green plus one green. Now there's something else that's going to happen and we're going to, shortly after we do this, as the kids play around with this, we're going to introduce the concept of fractions. And the Gitanya will tell you that fractions are the inverse of multiplication and we use division to get ourselves there. So we want to say if three greens, if it takes three greens, um, if three greens make a blue, then that means that green or blue is three times as long as blue. Or blue is three times as long as green. And green would be then one of the three times, one of three of the, the green is one of the three that fit in the blue. So it is a relationship between these two rods. That's what fractions are. So now we would say, so one third, so and we can't really teach, there's a point in teaching, he teaches the fractions and the multiplication side by side all the way through. You're gonna see this through book one and book two, and he's going to teach them, like as soon as you introduce multiplication, the fractions come immediately afterwards. If six times um, six times seven is forty-two, then seven is what? How much of forty-two? And we're going to be looking at the factors and figuring out how those are related. And this comes as a realization as the kids move on, um, as we start playing with these ideas as we go along. But so this is something that's always taught side by side. So we have one third. So. I'll erase this. Let's see here. Oh, so one third of blue, so we would write one third of blue equals a green. What else can we write? One third of blue plus two green equals blue. A third of blue plus two greens equals blue. Anyone else? But could we write two thirds of blue equals two green? Two thirds of blue? Of course you can. Two thirds of blue equals two green. And you could write two times one third of blue equals two green. Two? Ah, that's really good. Now we've introduced brackets. Two times a third of blue. This is also introduced in chapter three of book two. The brackets and the kids will come across this right away in kindergarten, first grade, whenever you start using book one. So two times a third of blue equals what? Two green? We could also write this as two times one third 
a blue equals two green. So green plus two thirds of blue equals blue. Green plus two thirds of blue equals blue. Could you say blue equals six halves of green? Six halves of green? Oh, well you can, but we've only got this. Are you talking about six halves of the dark green here? Blue equals? Three halves of it. So, okay. The three green. But where did our six come from? Well, you have to imagine the green cut in half and then you've got six of them. Yeah, you can. You can do that. I don't think it would come up with kids when they're little. But you can do that. I don't think it's apparent from the rods. So let's do, um, let's do, 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 do. Someone will come up with that though. Probably not in kindergarten, but somebody will. Somebody just did. Right. But I mean, it, like one of your kids will come up with it, not an adult. One yeah. Of kids will come up yeah. With it. It's not really coming out of the blocks. It's coming out of other knowledge, isn't it? Yeah. But, but that will happen right around like say seven or eight years old. They'll figure that out. If they've been playing long enough, it'll show up. And then you have to decide when you're playing the game, when you're playing a game like this, because this, we treat these as games, you have to decide what rules you want to use. And we didn't set any rules. We just said, what do you see? Um, so you'll have to decide whether that, that would be an acceptable thing in your game or not. With my son, you pretty much have to accept what he gives you. <laughs> he doesn't do well with, he's, he'll throw a tantrum very quickly if he's, if, if you don't follow his lead. Okay, well see, and that works. If that's, you know what I mean? If you get into a class room setting and you have kids who think the rules are one thing and you know, they, they've got classes. Yeah, that's, so that's true, you've got to have a- Yeah, you've got to have the rules. With a group. Hmm. Um, I'm gonna say, um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna say a third of blue. plus um, a green, plus a third of blue, plus a green, plus blue minus two thirds of blue equals a blue. And I'm gonna put this like this and this will show up five or six they can do that easily enough so when we've done this when we've done this with our kids we want to do this with say a missing rod so I'm going to write this one here and we're going to put in a missing rod and we're going to write one third of and we will have you're not going to do this. You're going to have your kids do this. So you're going to take their papers that they wrote this down on and they're going to do this. One third of something equals green. And they can do one third of blue equals something. We can do a fraction, if they know this is a fraction, but this will get hard. If they don't know this is a fraction when they're little, this will be hard. Can you do part of the fraction? Could you just put the square for the one or the three? Ah, uh, yep, you could do that. One, like third, a blue 
equals a green. And then you give this back to them later on and they have to fill in the answers. So what we want them doing is generating all of their own math problems. So their homework or their, the, 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 instead of using written problems on a page, they should be generating their own math problems. So you shouldn't have to do this. You shouldn't have to go looking for them. It is all stuff that they've created for themselves. So we go along, don't make them do it for every problem, just pick a few on the page and have them do it. You collect it and then you hand it back a week or two later and have them solve them. If you make them do all of them, they will hate you. And then they will hate math. If they write particularly good ones, like something like this, we do um, substitution games and we play other games, we write them on cards and when the kids come up with a particularly good statement, I will save it and throw it in there. And then we use them later to play other games, which we will get to later. So if you come up across really good ones, then you should save them. All right. I want to do a different rod. So we are going to do, let's see. Um, it's tidy and I'm going to give the child the task, the students the task to find all the possible trains or single color trains for a given rod. So basically we're looking for all the factors of a rod. So right here I have the, the orange rod. And then I have the factors of two and, and five. I have units, I could put in ones, but other than the units, we're not, I don't wanna do units. You can, if you want to, let's just do that and see what happens. There, I'll put in the units at the top. So we're going to play a substitution game. And we will imagine a white one at the end. You're just going to, this is all the rods I have. You can maybe draw a black line there. There we go. All right, so now we have factors. We're not gonna to talk to the kids about factors. What, what, they're, what, what they're, we're looking for them to discover is that there are multiple ways that you can break up some rods, but not all rods. Not all rods have single color trains. And so we can line up all the rods and we can find out whether they have single color trains or not. Some of them only have, can be made with a train of white rods and those we call prime numbers. Um, some of them have only one single color train. Some of them have multiple color, single color train, multiple single color trains. And we just want to play around with these ideas and get it into their heads. And then we want to play games. And we're going to play basically the substitution game again. So how can, we're going to write, um, let's see, let's do the easiest game we can do. We would just go crazy and write whatever you can see. So our rods have to, our trains, or our, our patterns, our statements that we make have to equal the orange rod. So I'm gonna let you write whatever you want, but it must equal the orange rod. So I'm gonna say orange, and so I'm going to write the first one and I will write, um, four W, plus two and two reds plus a half of red 
plus a white equals an orange. Who goes, who wants to go next? Anyone? Give us a minute. Okay. Claire, you want to go? Are you thinking? Give an easy one, maybe we'll give you a name. Gray, white. Okay. Yeah. Half red. Plus half a red. Plus two fifths of orange. Plus two fifths of orange. Plus two fifths of yellow. Now this is a good one because I'm looking at that and I'm going to say to you, as you just wrote this down, and this is one of our rules. Can you explain to me how you got that? I don't understand. And now, so, so now your student who just wrote that down gets to be the teacher, and then they get to explain it to their student how it is, how it is that they came up with the thing that they just wrote. So you guys have this screen here, and you can go up here, and you should be able to annotate, or I think you guys can pull down a spotlight, and then you can explain to me how you got that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, can you explain it to me because I don't understand. Yeah. So here's the three white. Is half of red. Are you using a mouse or the spotlight? I can't see it show up, but I see what you're saying. Okay, so you say here's your three whites, here's half a red. So now we're at two reds, right? Oh, there you are. Now I see it. Half plus two fifths of orange. Plus two fifths of yellow. Okay. And I might say to you, how do you know there's those are fifths of orange? And then you would say to me what? Because five reds can fit into an orange. Yep. There you go. All right, Claire, your turn. I always worry about your guys' internet connections. Claire, are you there? Oh, sorry. I turned off the sound. I forgot. Here I am. <laughs> sorry. No, I'll Let's try again. You. Oh, yeah. Were you talking yeah. to yourself? I was, totally. Yeah. <laughs> ha half, I'm going to say, half of orange. Okay, so half of orange. Forgetting what I said now. Damn. Um, yep. Plus... Uh, three halves of red plus uh, a fifth of orange. That's a fifth of orange. A fifth of orange is red. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a yellow. We have 
a red and we have another red and a white. So I'm going to do an orange minus half an orange plus um, two red minus a third, oh wait, hold on, two red minus two fifths of yellow plus, what do I have? I have, I have a, a red and I have a yellow. So I'm going to do um, plus three whites. And now we have an interesting conversation on do we need brackets for clarity or not? And I put them in because the kids like to use them. And it is always clear to them what goes together. So we could keep going for a really long time on this one. A really long time. So again, we can take all of these statements and pull out a single color, pull out a missing rod on any one of these statements and then give it back to the kids later. Then the other thing we have here that we can play with as we do this right here is not just this game here, but we're looking at um, equivalent fractions, we're looking at common denominators, uh, least common multiples, or least common factor, the greatest common factors. So we can play around with this and look at different um, equivalent fractions when we have this sitting like this. So, um, and they, because they go hand in hand, and we can see that um, 2 tenths of orange is the same as 1 fifth of orange. What else do we see? Four tenths of orange equals two fifths of orange. Okay, this is interesting that you did this. So I'm going to do so two tenths of orange equals fifth of orange, and then I want to do well. Uh, okay. Let's just do it here. Four tenths of orange equals two fifths of orange. And what else can we see? Eight tenths equals four fifths of orange. Eight tenths of orange equals Four fifths of orange. Now look what we have here. We come down. Here we have half an orange. Equals five tenths of orange. But there's not a red one here. That's an interesting thing. Look what happened there. And not all of these here 
have, a, have an equivalent in the yellow. So these are things, so we play notice and wonder. What do you notice about this? Because we didn't do notice and wonder yet, and we should. So what are some of the things, that's one of the things I would ask the kids to like, or that we could start like looking at when we play notice and wonder, what do you see on this? What do you see here? So these are the things that we notice, but they'll come up with these kinds of things. What do you notice? But what do you notice about this particular structure? And so what I notice here is that these lines, some of them match up and some of them don't. What else do you notice? I noticed that you can only make um, orange from the same color rods when it's white, red, or yellow, no other colors. Ah, so uh, orange equals white, red, and yellow single trains, no other colors. I'm writing with a mouse, by the way. You yeah. amaze me. I've done this. You should have seen when I first started. It was looked like this. Just <laughs> scratch. It was awful. <laughs> All right. What else do we notice? I noticed that the yellow rod is a prime number, and that's why I only mixed it up at the end of the white. Okay. So, so we noticed the yellow is prime. I notice that there's only two yellow. There's only two yellows. And then somebody, when I say that, some kid will raise their hand and say, oh, there's five reds and there's 10 whites. And there's one orange. And there's one orange. <clears throat> so there's something to these lines and how they match up and the colors that we can make them from and the colors that we can't. We can go look at other rods and try and make single color trains and see what's left over. So we can do this, and there's a pattern that will develop. The fives, sixes. So if one left, then two left. Um, this one will be three left. But then we go back to two left with this one and then one left with this one. And that will have to do with the rods that are, right, there's one left in this one, and it'll have to do with the, with the factors that are the same. And they will discover that on their own if you let them play and find out what the remainders are. And that's going to take you into division when you do that, how many plus a remainder. We don't have to introduce division yet, but those are ideas that we're starting to play around with when we do, the, when we do these games. All right, anything else I wanna cover on here? All right, I wanna look at two or more long trains. So we have uh, we've, we've compared the rods, we've made trains for single color rods. Let's do yeah, tidy. Give me a rod and let's make a multiple color train and we're gonna find as many trains as we can find to equal that one. So give me a color and however many. Shall we do, let's do seven, because seven's interesting, because there are no single color trains for seven, other than a white. 
But what happens if we do, that's the question we have. What happens if we do two black rods? What will happen? If we do two black rods, will we find a single color train? And what will happen if we do three black rods? Will we find a single color train? What do you guys think? These are all white rods going across. And I'm not going to do them all because I don't have enough. But you can imagine them all in there. All right. So can we do a, um, let's start with this one. Can we do a red train? Do you think? Yes, you can. Yes. Yes, we can. Can we do any other color train? No. So if we put a different one here, can we do a red train now? No. No, but can we do another color train? Green. Green. How does that work? I wonder. That's what I wonder. Because when you add odd with odd, it becomes even. And then when you add another odd, it becomes odd again. Is there a relationship to the number of black rods and the, no and the, the single color trains? Yeah, because three black rods, we can use green. And we had two black rods, and we could use red. So what do you think is going to happen? So can we make a prediction? If we put on the fourth black rod, seven, seven pinks. So you think we can use pinks now? Mm-hmm. And what's going to happen to that red? Can we use the red then? Yep. We can. We can't use. Can we finish out this red train to the end? Yes or no? Did you say yes, yes. Claire? Or... Okay, yes. So we want to play around with that and just see what happens if we have. And what color trains or what, what kinds of trains we can make, the more we add up here, what other trains will match down here and how does it change the, what, the number, based on the number of, of rods we have up top, the trains that we can make at the bottom. And let's see if we can find a pattern and let's see if we can make predictions. So if I have, so let's say without pulling out any rods, um, let's see, how many, for sure, where you would know for sure that you could use it, how many black rods would you need to have before you know for sure that you can use, say, the blue rod? Nine. Nine. So there would be seven. So if we had nine black rods, there would be how many um, blue rods? Seven. Okay. So let's see what we noticed over here. We had two black rods and how many red rods? Seven. And then we had three black rods and how many green rods? Seven. <gasps> so if we have four black rods, how many pink rods do you think we'll have? Seven. Oh my gosh! Do you see how cool that is? <laughs> I'm sorry, I find that really cool. <laughs> 
So you keep going and there's a pattern that comes up. So is that the same? Is that going to be the same thing for say, I don't know, the blue, the, the yellow rod? And will it be the same thing for, um, see, the yellow rod, that one, the green rod, what will happen? So will that pattern still hold through with all the other rods? Not with all of them. Oh, well, it will, but it won't. It will, but it won't be the first one for all of them. Okay. So we would want to find that out. And what happens? And is there a way that we can determine, like, like, like which rods behave a certain way and which rods don't? Is there a certain rods that behave... Like, because you're going to have, something's going to show up. You're going to have patterns that show up for your even rods and patterns that show up for your odd rods. But there's a different one that's going to show up for your, so like nine is not prime, but seven is. So there's a different pattern that's going to show up. So if something's going to happen with your prime numbers. It's different than happens with the other odd numbers. But there's certainly a pattern there that we can make predictions based on the, the way that the rods show up. And this is our first pre-number stuff to multiplication. Any questions? It's a lot of math stuff in kindergarten. Thinking. Yes. Victory and Hopeful, do you guys have anything? I am just thinking. Okay. I didn't say I am recording this. I am. Good. <laughs> Once you build this, by the way, you can then take and play your substitution game. This is a lot for all of this or however much you want to. All of these provide ample opportunities to play the substitution game. And then to play around with rods that have, you go up to without going over and playing around with whatever plus ha what, what color is your end cap. So when we, when we have pre-number activities, we don't call them remainders. We call them end caps and so what color is your end cap when you make a if you have two black rods and then you have a, a train a light green train what color is your end cap that's whatever has to fit in the end is there a reason for that like for um, not using the word remainder um not particularly i don't think so that's just what they did they call it that's just how they what they said so that's, we stuck with that and it was not a big deal until we introduced remainders. You can use remain, you can do whatever you want to in your house. Mm. As long as everybody, again, it's just as long as everybody agrees to whatever the language is that you're using. Yeah. And that for us was interesting to, you know, to see as you play it out, the different, um, the different end caps that come along or the remainders. I think we pretty much just called it a remainder. And then when we went to the BBL, they called it an end cap. And then I tried to use it and I didn't do it. But I think Lacey uses end cap on hers. Her kids do. Yeah. All right. Are you guys still thinking over there? Um, we good, thanks. It was great. You what? We're fine, and it was excellent. Okay, good. All right. Well, I don't have anything else. If you guys don't have anything else, this is a good stopping point at our pre-number activities. There's a lot. I mean, there's, there's a lot you can do. Lacey's got more ideas for you, but this basically is the games we played. 
and the stuff that you will find kind of in um, the handbook of activities and Gitenio stuff. So Gitenio just basically goes over the multiples and then he goes over um, the fractions and that's pretty much it for pre-number activities. And then he has you write the statements and then write, the, write them with a missing rod and that's it. But there's so much more there that you can play with. And I think I, everybody, we spent 18 months in chapter three playing games like this. So, <clears throat> all right, I think that's it. And I will see you guys. Sonia. Will yes. Sonia, um, we're just wondering if it wouldn't be too much trouble going half an hour earlier than this next time. Yeah, we can go half an hour. I, Claire, how do you feel about it? Do you want to go half hour earlier? That, that should be fine. Yeah, we can go a half hour earlier. Oh, hang on. What time did we hang on? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with starting at nine thirty instead of ten. That that's fine. <laughs> you you'd probably be very happy with that. It doesn't hurt my I, feelings at all. <laughs> I would probably have to drop out and and come back in if that happened because I have to take my kids to a thing at three o'clock. So that'd be two thirty for me. So I'd be taking them and then coming back. So I'd be. Yeah, not for, here for the whole thing, but if that works better for everyone else, that's fine. It's only every second week that I have that thing on, so. Okay. All right, so if you guys want to, we can switch it to 9.30. And there you yeah. go. That's the other thing. So you've already had your time change. This is actually the time it's going to be from now on, is it? Yes. Yeah, our time change was Sunday. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, yes, we can do a half an hour earlier then. All right. Well, I think that's it. And I will see you guys next week. We might get a few more people from the United States going because, you know, all the East Coasters, it's like midnight for them. And yeah. I think Union was like, yeah, I'll come. And then I said it was going to be at 10. And she's like, no, no, that's too late to stay up. <laughs> but she might be able to come for a bit at 9.30. Yeah, she might be more interested at 1130. But, but midnight was just a little bit too late for her. She wasn't going to do it. So... Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys, and I will see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah.